Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I hope everybody is doing well and that you had a nice Thanksgiving. Um, it was just a week ago, but it seems like it was a lot longer. <laughs> um, so what we're talking about today is the concept of radical acceptance. Um, this is actually, we did this topic last year and I felt like both Yvonne and I felt like we kind of kept coming back to it. Um, so we decided to devote two weeks to it this year. So we'll, uh, we're gonna talk about it today and then we're gonna talk about it next week also um, because it's really an important concept. Um, personally, um, for me, it's been very, very helpful in my own life. I was first introduced to this concept about this time last year, actually. It was around November of last year. And just, it was so helpful, you know, especially with everything going on last year with my um, own family, with, you know, struggles that my daughter was having, um, just being in the midst of the pandemic, working from home, you know, leading a school through distance learning. I mean, last year was hard in so many ways. And this concept of radical acceptance was so personally just very, very helpful. Um, and I hope that all of you find it helpful also. Um, you know, and I'm sure Yvonne's gonna get into this, but what I really love about it is it's what you do when you can't fix a problem. It's you can't, it, like you have no control over it. And the other thing that I always have to remember, and I know we're gonna get into this, um, <laughs> with this idea of radical acceptance, doesn't mean that you approve of what's happening. You don't have to like it, it just means you accept it. Um, and that's just, to me, like it was just mind blowing to like, oh, I can accept something, but I don't have to like it. Um, so Yvonne, what do you have for us? Yes, um, yes we're gonna do it over two weeks because I wanted this week to be kind of a reflection about ourselves and things that we have to accept about ourselves because we talk about it all the time um, that we have to model behaviors. And once we grasp that for ourselves, then I think it's important that we talk about how we model this for our children, how we, you know, maybe our expectations for our kiddos are too high, you know? Um, and so that's why I wanted to break it up into like for ourselves and then for our children next week. Um, so yes, we're gonna talk about radical acceptance. And many years ago, um, the Dalai Lama was interviewed and they were talking about happiness and motivation and mindfulness. And they asked him a question and they said, you know, what has been, you know, you've had all these amazing experiences in your life and, you know, what has been the happiest moment in life for you? And he kind of smirked and he responded, um, this one. And I always kind of like laugh about it because I, it strikes me because you know, when I think about good times in life, I always tend to reflect on things that happened in the past. You know, I'll, I'll catch myself thinking about my three boys when they were really little and they were so cute and so sweet. And, you know, I think about all those times that I wish I could go back to. And I don't really think about what's happening in this moment. And, you know, so when I really think about those times when, you know, everything was perfect and my kids were little, I actually like really delve into it. I'm like, oh gosh, I was exhausted. <laughs> I was frustrated. I was like praying that they would go down for a nap. I was like counting down the days till they were self-sufficient. You know, in that actual moment, I wasn't happy where I was. I was like somewhere else. I was zoning out. I was tired. Um, and this has been so evident for me since my son moved out the last few months of not having him around. I've had a lot of time to reflect on like missed moments. And the reason I'm talking about this is because mindfulness and like being in the present moment is a lot to do with radical acceptance. Um, there was a day, I think it was like two days after I dropped him off at college, I was driving and I actually had to pull over and I was like literally sobbing. I was crying and I, this is the silliest thing. And I was like, I wish I would have taken him to the park all those times that I could have, but was too tired or in a bad mood. And I was like literally crying and I called him and I was like, I'm so sorry. And he's like, oh my gosh, mom, you're so dramatic. Like, I don't, I don't remember when you took me to, you know? And so, you know, it, it kind of left me with this, like, I don't think there's ever been a moment in my life where I'm like, this is it. This is the moment, you know, like the Dalai Lama said, like, this is it. I've never 
actually experience that. And that's something that I hope um, that I'll be able to do, like really like in this moment, um, actually I had a moment with students yesterday where the other social worker and I were talking with three kiddos and I'm like, we're in this moment, we're all together, we're having a wonderful time. Like this is the moment that is like so important to me right now. And they were like, the kids were reflecting on it too. We we're talking about mindfulness and you know, we don't just accept the moment for what it is. We're always looking for something. We're always kind of in our heads. And so the concept of radical acceptance actually comes out of a, like a theoretical framework for counseling called DBT. And DBT, DBT is a type of therapy that teaches you how to live in the moment, helps you cope with distress, helps you improve your relationships and helps you like regulate your own emotions. And so radical acceptance is one of the tools of that type of therapy that helps someone who's experiencing like a bad situation or painful emotions and it helps them accept that without judging. So one of the goals of this therapy is to, it's distress tolerance. It's helping you manage whatever's going on in a healthy way. Like has anybody ever freaked out about something that you have absolutely no control over? Silly example, you're driving in traffic. <laughs> Kayla says all the time. By the way, Kayla is our social work intern from San Jose State this year. So Kayla, you're always welcome to chime in at any time as, as everybody else. Um, but think about the things that you freaked out about that you have no control over. The slow driver in front of me, um, the lady at the grocery store who kind of gave me attitude, right? Who was maybe being rude to me. I had absolutely no power to control that situation, yet I let my emotions get the best of me, right? Jenny, can you think of anything that you've been like super upset about that in reality you had no control over? Um, it put you on the spot. <laughs> it totally put me on the spot. I mean, I know there was one time well, when I was pregnant with my son, um, and this is such a silly, like first world problem. I was pregnant with my son and we had planned this vacation to go on this cruise, um, back, this was back, you know, before the pandemic when people still did things like that. Um, and I found out I was too pregnant to go on the cruise. Like I was like, they have a cutoff. I don't know if you guys have ever <laughs> been pregnant going on a cruise. Like they have a cutoff, like you can't go past this time. And I was going to be too pregnant to go. And like, this is just, and I don't, I'm, it's not that I'm not an emotional person. I just keep my emotions close to my vest. Like I don't ever, I think I'm well suited for my job because I don't ever freak out about anything. I always tell people like, if you see me freaking out, like the world's about to end. Like we, we all need to freak out because I don't ever freak out. Um, and I, I was just really pregnant and really wanted a vacation and I just lost it. My poor husband like has never seen me like just, I just lost it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was so upset and just, and there yeah. wasn't a thing you could, you can't change. No, the there was nothing I could do. I was 28 weeks pregnant. Like there was nothing I could do. And I hope Paul didn't go without you. No, no, we actually, we booked it. We, we were able to cancel that cruise and like get a, you know, credit for later. And we went on a different vacation. It was all fine, but it all worked out in the end, but I just, I, I was hysterical. <laughs> like I, I really was. And did your hysteria help them change their policy? No, not at all. No. <laughs> and that's kind of the idea. Radical acceptance rests on letting go of the illusion of control. And sometimes I think we have more, I think we think we have more control over certain things than we do. Like just because I turn off my kid's Wi-Fi doesn't mean he's going to sleep, right? I can think I have control over it, but at the end of the day, I have absolutely no control over what he does or doesn't do, right? So letting go of the illusion of control. And I love that they say illusion because like, let's talk about the things that we have the illusion of controlling, right? Our kids, the things that people think about us, the things that others do, other people's expectations of us, no control over those things as much as we want to. So I want to go back to the original question that you posted of like, what is worrying you right now? 
So think about what you wrote or what you were kind of pondering and like, what is your current worry right now? And then we're gonna further dissect that worry and determine whether or not it's in the category of have control over versus not have control over, right? Like there's things that I worry about that are like, I need to get healthier and drop some weight and you know, I have control over that, right? Um, the things that my in-laws say and do sometimes that I don't agree with, zero control, <laughs> right? So think about the worry that you have. Is someone ill? If so, is there anything you can do to change that? Are your kids unmotivated to do work? Is that something that you have the power to control? Uh, maybe you're worried about who your kiddos are hanging out with. As much as we try to put boundaries and rules and regulations, you have no control over who they're talking to here at school, right? So, you know, I am kind of going to touch on kids too, but like one of the things that comes to my mind is like how my kiddo does in school. How much control do I have over that? I spent the last two weeks micromanaging my eighth grader's education to the point that I think I got more grades and his grades are still the same. <laughs> So I had this illusion that I had more control than I did, but what came to happen was that he still didn't wanna do it. It just became that I had the awareness of what needed to be done, yet he's still not doing it. So it didn't really change anything except for probably raise my blood pressure, turn my hair gray and give me more stress. So how much control do you actually have? And again, I wanna to focus today on radical acceptance of ourselves. And then next week, what that really means as a parent um, and the challenges that come with not having control. So most of our suffering comes from our own expectations of ourself, right? So we all have expectations. And so think about for a moment, what expectations do you have for yourself? You know, do you expect that you're happy in a good mood all the time? Do you expect that your kids should have a gourmet dinner that you prepared from scratch every day? You know, is your expectation that you should never complain about working out or you should always be in a good mood when you go to work? Like, what are the expectations that you have for yourself and where did they come from? So notice what your expectations are of yourself and then try to determine where they came from. Um, why do I have this expectation of myself? Where did it come from? Why do I even believe this to begin with? Is this expectation of myself even feasible at all? Is it even necessary? Is this a way that I was brought up? Mine for me is that my mom always said like, even at the expense, in my mom's behavior said this too, even at the expense of myself, I need to put others first and be helpful. That was my mom's she gave up so much. She, you know, she was tired all the time and she stopped going to school to raise us. And she never like hung out with her friends because she, you know, had to take care of us and she cooked us dinner every night. And so I was raised with the expectation that I should put my feelings, thoughts, needs aside for the people that needed me. And so that's kind of how I was raised. But what's happened is this expectation of myself has led me to lose sleep, um, feel unsatisfied in my life, feel like a failure, you know? A lot of my own personal suffering has come from the fact that there's just not enough of me to go around. <laughs> there's not enough hours in the day to like be there for people. You know, this leads me to feel like a bad friend. Sometimes my friends call me after work and I just don't feel like answering the phone. Um, sometimes I go home and I feel like I should be with my kids and engaging with them, but I literally just wanna lay in my bed and reflect on the day and decompress. You know, some days I feel like a horrible wife because I should be there and make dinner for my husband and ask him about his day, but I'm like not really in the headspace because I've been asking people questions about themselves all day long, right? And so that expectation that I'm supposed to be helpful no matter what has created a lot of suffering. Um, you know, here, the, the three social workers that are here now, we have, 200 students that we're currently working one-on-one -on -one with. And my expectation is to help every single one of them. And what's happened this year is we don't have enough time to see kids multiple times. 
right? So we've seen them one time and we haven't got able to like come back around and see them again. And honestly, I go home some days feeling like the crummiest social worker, right? Because I put that expectation on myself of like, I have to do everything even outside of the confines of like time and capacity. Like we just can't do it. And so expectations can be good for us and they're good when we need things to strive for, but are the expectations that we have for ourselves things that make us feel sad, guilty, frustrated because maybe they're impossible, right? So I don't know if anybody can share the expectations they have for themselves, where that came from and how feasible is it? You know, like, what do you feel like? Do you feel like you should be happy all the time? What are your expectations? Lisa says, realizing where the expectations come from is a good start to stop being my own worst enemy. I totally like that. Um, Lisa, I was thinking about um, like my own expectations, you know, when you, you're telling, you know, talking Yvonne, and for me, like with work, I, I expect myself to be a good communicator. You know, I have my weekly emails and my newsletter. I put information out and I was thinking, where does that come from? And I think it's because it's been something that I've been praised for, like, oh, Jenny, you're so good at that. And so now, like, I feel like I have to like maintain this, right? And I have to keep this up. And I really, this is actually like where radical acceptance really um, helped me because I just remember in March of 2020 when I had zero um, answers about the pandemic and what was happening with school and I like literally I kind of shut down because I was like I, I don't you know I don't know what to communicate I have no answers and it was so hard for me I I like I honestly like those are it was so hard um Virginia has her hand up Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Sorry, I can't turn on my camera today because I'm at work, but <laughs> I'll quickly share. Um, I, growing up, had a very absent parent mm -hmm. and didn't feel like uh, my mom, was. she was there to support me financially, but not physically. Um, she was just working so hard. Uh, you know, she would work two, three jobs sometimes just to maintain the household, but that really affected me growing up. I felt like I needed her more like her there. So now I do everything as much as I can for my kids. And I'm always there. Like, and yes, it is very overwhelming. I um, overwhelm myself. I put way too much on my plate just because I feel like I have to do everything for them because I didn't have that. And I really do enjoy it, but it is very tiring to where um, I don't, I don't give myself any time whatsoever. Everything is about my kids. And mind you, I have four. So there's one of me and four of them. And I'm constantly like so involved because I feel like I have to be because that's something that really hurt me growing up. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. I totally yeah, get thanks that. Thanks for sharing, Virginia. That's so true. Anybody else have something they want to? I know, Lisa, you had taken yourself, um, you, you had shown your camera, but I don't know if you wanted to actually share anything. <laughs> no, I, I think um, your, your comment back about all these, all of these sessions, you know, the GL Spirit Force and the newsletter. Um, my daughter's a sophomore, but this is our first year here, and I'm amazed at everything you do. Every time I get one, I'm, I'm like, oh my gosh, she's like the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> How is she doing this? <laughs> Where does she pull this from? <laughs> you know, you know, so. Uh, I keep, so, I keep yeah. a lot of lists. <laughs> I, I, I bet, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm an executive assistant, so I'm taking care of people all day long too um, and cat herding. Uh, so uh, sometimes I feel like uh, it, it all goes there. And then I'm like, well, what, what's left in the tank? for my family and then I'm beating myself up for my own self care and not doing that, which is, you know, you know, all that. Yeah. So, so, but realizing where those expectations come from so I can get out of my head would probably be really helpful. Yeah. And so yeah. You, it makes you kind of wonder like where my kiddos expectations of themselves are probably coming from what they've seen from me. Yeah. Like how am I modeling that for them? Yeah. You know, do they take care of themselves? I always say like, something's got to give. I could be social worker of the year, but then I'm probably not wife and mom of the year, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Like something has to give and what is that going to be? And I think it's the expectations that are not met 
that cause us a lot of distress. And that's when we bring up like that distress tolerance. Humans are not inherently wanting to be uncomfortable. We're trying to avoid pain, right? We pull our hand away from the stove when it hurts because we don't want to hurt, right? And so the tactics that we use to avoid stress are sometimes, you know, things that we had put on ourselves. Like sometimes we're our own, like it's a, who said that we're our own worst enemy, right? <laughs> like we put a lot of expectations of what we're supposed to be, supposed to be, you know, mom who like, is happy to cook dinner. Like who told me that? <laughs> like, was my mom smiling every time she cooked? Probably not, but I learned that somewhere. And so trying to like make it okay. And that's why I always encourage parents to like, if you're struggling or going through something, that's nothing to hide from your kiddos. Like it's normal to struggle. Like, why do we feel like we're supposed to have it all together? Like I'm a social worker. So all my kids are supposed to have perfect mental health. And we all know that that's not true if you've been listening to us for the last couple of years, right? And so where do those expectations come from? Um, you know, one of the expectations that I've heard people say too is like, I'm not supposed to ever be upset. Like what? If you're human, you're going to, your emotions are going to fluctuate. And why is that not something that we normalize, you know, not being okay. And so when we realize that we're not okay, how do we handle that? And that's where this distress, this idea of distress tolerance comes up. Um, you know, some of our current realities are uncomfortable. Sometimes the state of the world is uncomfortable. And when I talk about like anxiety and stress, one of the strategies that I always encourage students to, students to use is to ride the wave. Meaning um, if you're out in the ocean and you're kind of losing steam and you can't swim and the current's getting stronger, the more you fight, the more you sink. And sometimes just letting go and floating is how you get through the tough wave, right? One of the examples that I used last year, and you know, we talked a little bit about the pandemic is, it was so weird because life had completely changed, right? Like everything was so different. My kids were at home and I had, instead of just accepting that this is where I was, I kind of took it upon myself to create this environment in my home of like structure and organization and keeping everyone on task and making us go for walks. And we started a garden and I had them doing art projects and we cooked dinner together. It was like, those things were not things that I normally did, but I was trying so hard to fight what was happening that I created this like frenzy for myself. It was like, you know, we were, I was working overtime to create schedules and anything to make my kids feel normal. You know, we sat at the table, which was something that we never did. And it was like, why am I doing all of these things to create some normalcy? And it so wasn't normal, right? It was like, I was fighting so hard to make it normal. And it just wasn't like, my kids were just talking the other day. They're all, remember when you made us write postcards during the pandemic? That was weird. I'm like, oh my gosh, I totally did. Remember when we started that garden that died in three weeks? And I'm like, oh my gosh. It's like, I was putting so much energy. I was trying to paddle to the surface instead of just floating and let be what was. Right? I, was Just laughing. <laughs> I was looking, oh, I'm laughing because I'm laughing at myself because <laughs> I was looking for something the other day and I came across this like little like mini whiteboard where I had Nathan's like pandemic schedule, like, you know, <laughs> this 45 minutes, he's working on math and like this 45 minutes, he can do this. And I was like, oh my God, if I had like, that's not who I am, but it was trying to be so regimented with. Yeah, totally. It's like once we established what the new normal was, it was like life was a lot less stressful. But in that moment, it was like, oh my gosh. Um, there's a book, Radical Acceptance. I think her name is Tara Brock or Brock, I think. And one of the things she stresses is that when you accept something fully, you can't fake it. Like you really actually have to accept it. And again, like, like Jenny said in the beginning, like you don't have to like it. You don't have to have chosen it, but you do have to accept that it is what it is right now. And some people feel like, oh, that seems very passive just to accept things as they are. But most of the things that are stressful for us, we really truly have no ability to change. Um, when we talk about pain and suffering, there are actually four options. We have four choices when something is uncomfortable for us. And so I'll go through what those four choices are and why it's important to choose radical acceptance. The first choice is 
problem solving. Now, of course, this is only relevant if you can actually solve the problem, right? Which isn't all of our issues. There's some things that we can solve, right? Yeah, yeah, I can go to the gym and eat healthier. I have that control over that. But I can't control again what my mother-in-law thinks about my house, right? Or whatever, whatever the situation is. So I can fix a situation if I have the power to do that. But I think it's important that when we're determining if we have the power to fix it, sometimes we have this false idea that we, again, have more control than we do. So the first option for a problem is to solve it. Um, sorry. The second one is changing your perception. And I'll use the analogy of like a bad boss. I don't have one of those, but if I did, um, I could change my perception on a situation, right? I can say like, oh, this is horrible. Woe is me. I hate this person. I can't deal with it. Or I can change my perception to say like, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to learn how to work with somebody that really frustrates me, right? Same, the situation with like the in-laws, right? I actually love my in-laws, by the way. Um, but like, I can use this to really learn how to empathize with other people's thoughts and beliefs, right? I could choose to be mad or I can choose to change my perspective um, and you know, build compassion and empathize with them. If that's an option that I have of changing it. So it's solve the problem, change your perception, radically accept the situation is choice number three. It means wholeheartedly, like fully with your being, accepting what is real, saying things like it is what it is and giving up your resistance to that situation. You know, I will never be able to change the perspectives of people in my life. I will never force them to believe how I believe. And I just have to accept that this is how they feel. It doesn't change who they are. You know, this is just what they believe. And maybe I don't agree with it, but that's okay. They're entitled to their own beliefs. Um, so that's the third choice, which is the obvious choice of really trying to accept that I have no power to change it. And the fourth choice, it sounds kind of mean, but you can actually choose to stay miserable. <laughs> you know, sometimes there's things where you put energy into them and you're mad and like, it feels good to be mad and you need that just to like, I can complain about them. I can be miserable about, miserable about it. But at the end of the day, who is that doing harm to, right? Me, I'm feeling stressed. I'm ruminating about it. I'm like not happy about it. And that's something that I could choose to do if I wanted to stay miserable. Um, so I want you just to reflect on the choices of like, when you think about that worry that you have, is it solvable? Is there a way that you can change your perspective about that situation? Is this a situation where you can just accept the current reality as is, not like it, not have chosen it, but just accept it? Or do you want to stay miserable? I think it's important too. I'm just thinking about like my week and I've had some tough days this week. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to remember that you can choose one way and then change your mind. And like, or just like, like, I want to say like the staying miserable, like I had a rough day um, yesterday. Um, it was not an easy day. And um, I kind of wallowed in it last night a little bit. I was like, you know what? I mean, but I like, it, I use it to some indulgence and self-care. I'm going to like really, and not even so much last night, the night before, like I had two bowls of cereal, Captain Crunch for dinner. <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to bed early. And it's kind of like, like, I'm going to like feel miserable and I'm going to wallow in this a little bit. And then like, I don't know, today I'm like, no, I'm, you know, and I'm like going down your list and I'm like, you know what, I'm going to change my perspective about what happened and how mm -hmm. I'm going to address this and like, like what, how I'm going to feel about it. Um, but I think it's, sometimes it's okay to let yourself like, you know, when something bad happens to like, I know I feel bad about it. <laughs> and yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You can't, you can't stay there. Like that. I think that's the important part about this. Like when something bad happens, it's like, of course you're going to feel badly about it. Yeah. You're not going to be happy. Um, but you can't stay in that place. Like that's not a productive place to stay. And that, um, and I know we're not, 
we're more talking about with our kids next week, but that's the important thing. Cause I think a teenage brain, they like to stay in that, like feel bad about it and like be miserable about it. They like to stay there. So imagine if you're a teenager and you're in that like stay miserable phase and then mom comes over and it's like giving you all the advice in the world to fix it. Like how annoying and frustrating that might be. <laughs> That's something that I think a lot of us have been guilty of, of not giving them the space to feel what they're feeling, right? And not normalizing that it's okay to be ticked off sometimes. It's okay to not approve of other people's behaviors. It's okay to feel what you're feeling. It's like, we're so quick to respond with trying to help that maybe they're just stuck in misery right now. And maybe that's just what they need. And I, I think allowing them the space to process that and be supportive and validate those feelings, I think is something that, you know, we really, really need to do. I, that's what I like, what you just said, validate your feelings. That's actually what I love about the concept of radical acceptance is it does validate your feelings. Um, and you get to, like, it's just that, like, I'm really unhappy with what has happened. Like, this situation, I, it's not what I wanted at all. This is, um, you know, like, like, you use radical acceptance when you can't, like, we've been saying, like, when you can't change it. Like, this is, like, something that you can't fix. You can be very unhappy about it. And so I think it, like, is validating your feelings to yourself. And I think that that's such a healthy thing to do. Yeah, one of the concepts that's really important in radical acceptance is the concept of suffering. And what is the difference between something painful happening and actually experience suffering? And this is where what you just said about the importance of validating your feelings is it's actually pain, like something painful happening plus denial. So just trying to move on through it equals suffering. It's pain plus denial equals suffering. So it's something where like pain is normal. We can't change that that happens, but we can validate those feelings, really feel the feelings, acknowledge them and accept them rather than just denying them and trying to move forward. And then the suffering kind of surfaces if we don't deal with it. Right. So I think it's super important that we feel the pain, acknowledge the emotions, validate it's okay that I feel like this right now this is where I am and then proceed to move forward because if we don't and we're stuck then that's just going to lead us to, to more suffering it's like of course you want things to be perfect but we live in an imperfect world where things are going to come up and situations are going to happen and how do we manage them you know we have control over how we manage painful situations and that's where you know why radical acceptance like why is this the right choice and you know it talks about like, why accept reality? Well, if we reject reality, does it actually change reality? No, <laughs> it's the same, right? It's still there. You know, changing reality actually requires you to first fully accept it, not be happy with it, not have chosen it yourself, but accept that this is what it is and I have zero power to control it. Um, Pain is something that we can't avoid. It's going to happen. Bad things happen, unfortunately, all the time. And, you know, it's something where we have to not be happy about it, but we have to move through it, feel it and move through it. Um, rejecting reality turns pain into suffering. Refusing to accept reality can keep you stuck in unhappiness, bitterness, anger, sadness, um, I have a situation right now with a student who's kind of going through like some family things and the things that have happened in the family have been really, really challenging. And the student is just not ready to accept that that's the truth and watching the suffering and the hoping that he could like go back in time and change things is something that doesn't happen. And, and it just is kind of like an example of like how we perpetuate our own suffering by denying it. You know, there's been things in life and things in family and things at work that I literally wish I could change and I can't. Um, and I think it's important to know, like, I can't do everything, right? I can't see all the kids that I want to see. I can't, you know, be there for everybody that I want to be there for. And I have to accept that that's, that that's okay, that I'm doing the best that I can 
you know? So again, thinking back to that worry that you, you know, you thought of in the beginning of like, can you be okay acknowledging that that's just where you are right now and you have no power to change it? Um, it says acceptance may lead to sadness, but deep calmness usually follows, right? Sometimes it's it gets worse before it gets better, if you will. Um, the path out of hell is through misery, but refusing to accept the misery that is part of climbing out of hell, you fall back down, right? So just accepting that it's going to be tough. Um, it doesn't mean liking it. It doesn't mean putting your stamp of approval on it. it doesn't mean that, you know, it's fair. And it's just acknowledging that it's painful and that you can't change it. So um, I hope Yvonne, if you'll um, indulge me a minute. Um, so with this concept of radical acceptance, so I, I know I shared this last year with parents, but, um, we were having to do family therapy last year as a family, um, cause my daughter going through severe depression, um, and it was DBT, um, family therapy. And so we like went through this and I have this worksheet. I have my binder from this. Oh, I'm so glad so you have take. it. Um, and so I have this worksheet that I had to fill out a year ago. And so and I had to fill this out on, um, November 11th, 2020. So it was just over a year ago. And so I was looking in like preparing for today, I was looking at this worksheet. And so I have two things that I needed to radically accept and that I needed to accept last year. And so what I wrote down was my daughter's decision about college. And at this time last year, she you know, told us that she did not want to go to a four-year college. She wanted to go to a junior college. She just felt like she was not ready to go away to college. And so I had it like, it was very difficult. Like I had like pushed, you know, her whole life that she was gonna go away to college. And then I had to accept that like, she made a different decision um, and it was very difficult. And I also <laughs> wrote down, this is so hilarious. I wrote down that I hate running. You hate Reddit? Is that running, no, no, running. Oh, I thought you said Reddit. No, and I remember like last November, cause I had been working out like every day on my Peloton bike. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna like, start running again because I used to be a runner and I went and I ran and um it was so difficult I ran for 20 minutes and I thought I was going to die it was awful and so I was like I just have to accept I'm not a runner anymore and I have to accept this about myself mm -hmm. and so now a year later and I did like this was like really I mean the running thing was silly but like with Hannah uh, and her decisions about college and like going through this and being like, I'm not going to fight this. I'm going to accept this. I don't have to like this decision. This is not what I wanted for her, but I have to accept this. And it's just like, I look at this from a year ago and I like everything that's happened in the past year. And I look at like how much healthier she is now. And like, that was such, it was the right decision for her and, you know, where she is in her life. Um, and I actually have started running again. <laughs> like now I can run for 20 minutes and it's easy. It's like not hard anymore. <laughs> and so um, it, it's just, you know, so I think that I actually think what it would be a great exercise. I don't know if anybody keeps, if you guys keep journals or something like that, but like, like over this next two weeks, when we talk about radical acceptance to like write down, like, what are you having to accept right now? And put it someplace that you can come back a year from now and reflect on be like, oh, wow, that was such a big deal. And I was so consumed with that a year ago. And now like, it's okay. I love that you have one that you have that worksheet. I love that worksheet. And two, that like, you are able to like, see how it, things turned out, right? Like how many things you look back in the past that felt so just like distressing and horrible. And then when you reflect on like how you got out, out of that, got through that. And then it kind of showed you like, that was kind of a necessary step to be where things are today, right? Like Hannah's like thriving. She's doing what she wants to do. She's feeling healthier. And it's like, in that moment of like terror of like, oh my gosh, she's not going to go to four years, but to be able to reflect back and be like, man, things do work out. Like how many problems yeah. did I have from 10 years ago that haven't been resolved one way or another right now? None really, you know, it's just things that, that are difficult, but I love that. I'm going to write, so I'm going to try to figure out today what I'm going to write down for next year to reflect on that because that's really powerful and you're running and like, <laughs> <laughs> good job for you. 
<laughs> so like using that for an example, Junie, like I, the activity is to take the worry of something in the past. So that was like perfect timing. And like, what did you have control over when Hannah decided that she didn't want to go to a four year? I mean, I didn't, like, and that, that was what I was having to like a year ago, having to really accept. I had no control over it. I couldn't mm-hmm. force her to yep. go away to college. I mean, what am I going to do? You know, just like tie her up and drop her off at a college. <laughs> That's not going to work. <laughs> you know, I, I had to accept that she was going to be an adult. Like this was like her first real, I mean, at the time she was still 17. She was a senior in high school. School, but she was like making this decision but it was her decision like I and I had to accept that yep and that was and, kind of like the next part of like what was your response to that situation I mean you didn't have I a mean, choice <laughs> I didn't have a choice I mean and I was and it was it was really difficult because I mean as I've shared she had been going through severe depression and that's why you know, at the time, like last fall, she was at a pretty low point. Like, you know, she was coming out of it. Um, she had been uh, hospitalized the summer before. And, you know, we were just, we were really like slowly coming out of it. But, you know, last fall when it, as the, those of you that are parents of seniors know that this is the time of year that you're applying, that they're applying for college. And she was not in a mental place where she could apply for college. Yep, yep. And, um, and so I, it, like, I had, like, the struggle I had was very internal, because I very much felt like I could not express to her any of the struggle that I was having, because I didn't want to, like, make her feel worse, because I know, like, her admitting this, like, was really hard for her, and I didn't want her to feel bad, so I had to be very outwardly supportive, but I was, internally, I was struggling a lot. It was very, very difficult. Yeah, yeah, and it's, you've, you were now able to reflect on that silver lining, right? Like the silver lining of that situation, like she's able to get well. Yeah. Able to have extra time with her, right? Yeah. You're able yeah. to be there and she gets to experience what she's experiencing. And I, and I think that's the beautiful thing is when we can look back on the things that we actually did choose to finally accept, how did they turn out? You know? um, so accept what is, acknowledge reality. It is what it is, and I have no control to change. Determine the things that we can change versus what we cannot change. That's a hard one. Sometimes I really still feel like I have more power than I do. And I have to remind myself, like, you're not that powerful. (laughs) You don't have control over that situation. Um, Looking at a situation from a non-judgmental perspective. Again, we're our own worst critics. Stop fighting and denying reality. Just let yourself kind of float to the surface when you're in a situation that's difficult. You know, learn how to live in this present moment despite pain. And pain is different for different people. Um, You know, it might be something that's really big. Like what if you're experiencing something that's really painful, like somebody that you lost, right? Acknowledging those feelings. It doesn't change our grief to radically accept. It just helps us to move forward. There are going to be things that happen that are so unfortunate and horrible, and we can either let them kind of destroy our faith in humanity and life, or we could acknowledge them as a painful part of life that we have no power to accept and that we're here. And one of the, the ideas is to accept reality as if you chose it for yourself. And if you think about things that are really difficult, of course, we're not going to choose to lose someone. Of course, we're not going to choose, you know, of course, we didn't choose to have a pandemic that lasts, has lasted as long as it has, right? But what would it look like if I had chose something? I would have a positive attitude about it. I would be more motivated to continue to move forward. So choosing and accepting something as if you chose it, even though you didn't. And so I want to do some kind of like beginner steps of radical acceptance, you know, maybe not starting with like radically accepting that you lost a parent, radically accepting that you lost a a friend, but maybe starting with things that are small and building that confidence that you're able to, you know, accept things that are difficult. Long checkout line at the grocery store. That's a good starting spot. Um, I don't know about you, my husband, I drive him nuts where if we go to the grocery store and the line is long, I leave him in the line so I can still go wander around because I just cannot stand there and it drives me bananas. 
And then we have this really sweet guy that works at the grocery store that just talks a lot. And it just like, and so I'm going to practice this week when I'm in that line to just be there. This is what it is. This is everybody else is buying groceries as well. Like, what is that situation for you that can be like your beginner step situation? Is it traffic? Is it your Wi-Fi went down? Is it, you know, something frustrating about your partner, something frustrating about your kiddo? Um, what can be that beginner step to practice feeling comfortable with discomfort? So that's a part one of the activity for next week. I want you to come with an understanding of feeling uncomfortable and being okay with it. It's like, we're so quick to want to get out of discomfort that we'll do whatever we have to, but what little things can we do to practice sitting with discomfort? And here's a couple examples of like coping statements that you can use. Um, this is how it has to be right now is a coping statement. This is what it is. This is how it has to be. You know, it's a busy time of day and the grocery store long, lines are long and this is just what it is. And I'm going to sit here and maybe reflect on good things that happened today. Um, I can't change what's happening right now. There's no point in fighting the past. Um, I can survive something difficult even if I don't like what it is, is a big one. There's so many things each day that happen that we don't like or that we're uncomfortable with or that we wish were different, but can we continue to just move forward on that? Um, I'm going to, I think I'll save these for next. There's a couple words that give us a red flag of whether or not we're accepting or not. And one, the biggest one is the word should. And if we're saying should about something, it kind of gives us an idea that maybe we're not content with where we are. I should be more motivated to go home and hang out with my kids after work. I should do better at creating meal plans for my family, right? I should spend more time with my parents. You know, Jeannie, what are your shoulds or anyone else? Is there any shoulds or expectations that you have for yourself this week that you can work on, reflect on, figure out where they came from? I should be okay with helping Nathan with his homework. <laughs> I should not dread it. <laughs> I should not want to choke my child when I'm doing math with him is mine. <laughs> so we're on the same page. <laughs> Does anybody have any shoulds that they can share? And then we can kind of figure out like, where did those shoulds come from? I should be happy all the time at work. <laughs> you know, just remembering that you are human. It's okay to not be happy in every experience. It's okay to be in a bad mood sometime. It's okay to get irritated when your kid leaves their dinner plate on their nightstand in their bedroom, even though you told them not to eat in there. It's okay to feel upset about that. You know, so just reflect on the things for yourself this week of like the shoulds. So your two assignments are reflect on what your shoulds are and where they came from and are they feasible? And the second one is find a small activity or frustration in your life that you can practice tolerating, accepting, changing perspective on. So I think I'll pause there for next week. And then when this radical acceptance comes to our teenagers, it's a different, it's a different beast, if you will. So I really want you to practice this for yourself this week so that when we come back next week, we can really delve into what are the expectations for our kiddos? What is our expectation communicating to our kiddos, right? Praise and rewards. You mentioned this a little bit. You talked about this, Jenny, of like, you feel like you should be doing these things because you've been praised for them. Um, so I should accept bad grade when my son brings home and try to comfort myself. He did his best already, even though I know he sneaks to play the game. Yep, I think that it's not... It, I don't want to, us to confuse it as like complacency. Like, I'm okay that my kid does terrible, no, I think it's more like, I'm okay that this is where we are right now. And I hope 
that things can change and trying to figure out how we can help those things and then determining, do you have the ability to change his grade, right? What, what is it that you're doing? I, I asked a parent yesterday, I said, okay, so every time you check school loop, which is 15 times a day, you text your son and you're mad about it. How many of those texts have actually created in him the desire to do better versus how many of those texts have really pissed him off and made him not want to do anything but shut down, <laughs> right? So I don't think it's about accepting that you're okay with it. Because remember, radical acceptance isn't about being okay with it or thinking it's good, but it is what it is right now. Um, accepting helps us calm down and then we can deal with the, with the problem. Absolutely. And I think that's it. We have to give ourselves grace to be human and grace to accept the things that we can't change. And I think when we practice this with our kiddos, it feels a lot more supportive and validating than just criticize, criticize, criticize. And I think in the long run, we have more um, positive outcomes. So, and we'll get more into that next week. All right, thank you so much, everybody. Let me stop recording.